about Rijal al Hadith, the men of Hadith. You know what that means, right? The Hadith that we quote, they are narrated by the noblest of the noblest of people who heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or heard it from the people who heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there were over 100,000. Imam Malik said to him, leave that aside. Everybody talks about Rijal al Hadith. There are so many of them. And most of them are young. You know why they were young? Because they had to have good memory. And we all know when you're younger, memory is better. Yes? We all agree. Elders, we agree. I'm now 35 and I feel the, my memory loss starting. So they are under 35. Rijal, more than 100,000 who brought us this deen. Imam Malik said, leave alone the men of hadith and let's sit down and talk about Nisa ul hadith the women of hadith. Everybody says Rijal ul hadith What about Nisa ul hadith And he counted just by sitting there more than 10,000 of the women of hadith with their lineage, with their characteristics. He knew everything about them. They are in the books of Al-Jarah wa Ta'deel. They are the books which tell us about the narrators of hadith. So my brothers and sisters, I'm just making this point, emphasizing because we have sisters here, alhamdulillah, and I want to include them. I want them to know that they play a huge role in the success of this ummah. Let me add one more thing before I get into my topic and get the ball rolling as they say. Just a little bit more emphasis, I want to include our sisters among the young men in this struggle, in, this, in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know who is behind the great Imams Malik, Shafi'i and Ahmad ibn Hanbal? Among many others. Do you know who were the great ones behind them? Do you know how they became the great Imams of all time uh, after the Tabi'een? It was their mothers. Do you know how old their mothers were? They were not more than 30 years old. Do you know how old Imam Ahmad's mother was when she subjected him to the education and knowledge? She was 18 years of age. 18. She was a widow. Widow. And she said to her son Ahmad, learn the character. Learn the adab of your teacher before you learn his knowledge. Imam Malik, his mother was below 30. When she took him herself to the Masjid al Nabawi and she chose for him his teacher, Rabi'atul Ra'i, Imam Malik was 10 years old. How old was he? 10. And he had memorized the Quran. And she said to him, Learn from Rabi'ah his character before you learn his knowledge. She was the inspiration. Do you know what Imam Malik wanted to become before he became a scholar? And scholar is an under, understatement. Before he became a allama, an, an emblem of knowledge. He wanted to become a singer. Do you know what it to become? A singer. Because he had a nice voice and he used to sing. So he, and he was very good looking. He came to his mother and his mother said to him, son, you want to become a singer? That's fine. But let me warn you about something. I want to inform you how young women had the, they were the, they were the drive, the turning point of these great Imams. She said to him, if you want to become a singer, that's good. But there's a problem. Singing comes with good looks. And you don't have it. And that deterred him away from that to become Imam Malik as we know him. Imam Shafi'i's mother, under the age of 30, she took him from Mecca and sent him to Medina to learn of the great Imam Malik. She taught him the Quran at the age of seven, memorized it all. And he memorized Al Muwatta for Imam Malik at the age of 10 or 12. 
and he was a poet at the age of 11. She was his inspiration as well. So I want to include our sisters in this. And I want the young men to understand that when you get married, inshallah, to take good care of your wives. Because what you are taking care of is not just a woman. You are actually preparing a generation to come. The mother, as the poet in Arabic says, الأم مدرسة إذا أعددتها أعددت شعبا طيب الأعراق. The mother is an educational institution on her own. She is a school, a university. If you look after her and prepare her, you would have prepared a whole generation to come of youth full of great character and morals, full of leadership. And you know, uh, we always complain that women talk too much. Am I right? Yes? Dare I ask the men to put their hands up if they agree with me? It's scientifically proven. I'll just give you that. I'll save you. I can see some of the brothers afraid to put their hands up because they get caught on camera and their wives will see them upstairs. <laughs> Have to go back home and pay for it. <laughs> okay. I'll give you your excuse from now, inshallah. Scientifically proven, it is the nature of women that they talk more than men. In fact, they made statistics that they talk about 24,000 words a day. And men talk between 9,000 to 14,000 on average. So that gives you when the young brothers, if you want to get married, I'm giving you a hint, a head start, inshallah. You go and work and you come back home. If you've already used up your 14,000 words, you've still got another 10,000 to go. You have to listen. And I'll give you some advice, inshallah, for the newly wedded ones, inshallah. So, why do they talk so much? There is a wisdom behind that. Children, children, it's not easy for them, children under the age of 10, it's not easy for them to understand something very quickly. They need to be spoon-fed. Do you agree with me? Those of you who are parents. Children need to be spoon-fed. So they require more words to explain things. Me as a father, I know this. If I come to explain my son or daughter something, I can't be bothered to explain too much. I choose minimal words which have big meaning. And if he doesn't get it from the first or second time, I get frustrated. I say, go to your mother. But the mother keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And the child asks a thousand questions. <laughs> I say, explain to him. I'll be the introduction. You be the body. And then I'll be the conclusion. Bring him when you want me to make a conclusion. So alhamdulillah, this is why. Let us not ridicule and look down upon them. You know what? Please excuse me. I made this introduction, including our sisters, because it is very, very important. It is vital. It is vital, brothers, that our sisters are with us in this pathway in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it wasn't for people like women like Aisha radiallahu anha and Khadija radiallahu anha, who were role models for not only women but for men. You think this whole deen would have reached us in its completeness that it did with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Aisha radiallahu anha, you know how many of the scholars she taught among the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? More than 1,000 who narrated hadiths from Aisha radiallahu anha. If you recite, you look in Bukhari and Muslim, Tirmidhi, you'll find how many hadiths are narrated by Aisha radiallahu in the hundreds. And these were men who heard them from her. If we do not include them, then how can we be a civilization? The West, the West, the Western world after World War I, they wanted to change the woman from a woman who raises the children from a woman who is educated and uses her education in the pathway of her children to make her a commodity and that if she has education to use it in the outside world to benefit big businessmen and entrepreneurs 
in the world of capitalism. So now they, they, in the West they draw the woman from being a wife, a mother, from being a person of education. And if she is a person of, of, of education, they take her out of the home to neglect the children in order to use her energy to build the outside world for the man. This is a trick, my brothers and sisters. I encourage our sisters and our brothers to become educated, but to be careful what kind of knowledge they learn. At the same time, where will you, where will you use this education? Where will you use your skills? The best place to use them is in your family. And the best place to use them is within your community. And I say to my sisters, the best good that you can ever do with your education, with your skills, with your energy, with the power which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, is to raise a human being. To raise a human being. Not to raise skyscrapers. Raise a human being. And the fathers, the brothers, are the protection. They're the defense. They're the maintainers. They're the caretakers. They're the ones who monitor and maintain this woman, these children, this family, this household. We as men, if you like, if you want me to put it in simple words, we are the external affairs. And the women, our sisters are the internal affairs. They produce, we provide the means. The men provide the means and bring in, and the women produce. And watch what they can produce, mashallah, if you give her that opportunity. I am surprised, and I'm sorry for saying this, if it may offend some people, but I say it from the bottom of my heart. In Australia, there are times where I go places to give lectures or durus, and I'm disappointed that our sisters are not included. So we see beautiful, we see young men, mashallah, but my brothers, we cannot do it without our sisters. Because the mothers spend more times than the fathers with their children at home. And we want educated sisters in Islam and even in secular education to a certain extent. Halal education.